Thank you for that, Brother Marvin. That, he, he told me it was four different versions of that song he had to do, and what a great, that was, that was awesome. Thank you, Brother Marvin, for that. This morning, let's open our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. The title of my message this morning is, is entitled, In the Hollow of His Hand. In the hollow of his hand, and I'm, I'm going to give some illustrations uh, this morning that, that hopefully illustrate this. Um, I want you to think, before I read the scripture, I want, to think, I want you to think of, of a shepherd, a sheepfold. I want you to picture in your mind that sheepfold and, and the, those brick walls that they would, they, they would build. And, and the sheep would come into that fold, and the shepherd would sit in the gate, and he would guard from anything coming in. And so this, the idea of that, that sheep fold was the, in the hollow of his hand. That hollow of his hand that, that was protected. All right, let's look in Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to read much of this, uh, Isaiah chapter 40, excuse me. Uh, we're going to read much of this chapter. We're going to start in verse number 9. O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into, into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the God of, behold the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with a span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. You can see my, the title of the message is right there, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. Let's open a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we, as we look at this passage of scripture, as we discuss the, the idea the, the, of, of being in the hollow of your hand, Lord, I just ask that you'd open our eyes. Lord, help us to, to, to understand and to know, to experience being in the hollow of your hand. Lord, I just ask that you'd help me as I speak. Lord, help me to say the things that you want me to say. Help me to be clear and concise. And, and Lord, I, I, I want your help. I need your help. Lord, I, I ask for each one of us here that, that we would leave with something that, that we got from the, the word of God. Lord, we love you, and, and, and with all of our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. Like I said before, the title message in the hollow of his hand, the first point I want to bring forth this morning is the goodness of his presence. The goodness of his presence, and, and as, as we look at, at verse, number, verse number nine there, it talks about, behold your God, the goodness of his presence. I have a couple of points under this. The uh, first point here, uh, number one is behold your shield. And right there it says, at the end of that verse, lift up and be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Now Isaiah was, was obviously he was a prophet. He was one of the major prophets. Only from the idea that, not that he was the most important prophet, but the major prophets are called major prophets because of the length of their books. But if you look at Isaiah and the volume of, of material that he wrote, it's one of the largest, longest books in the, in the Bible. And the importance of Isaiah um, is it, magnificent. There's so many references to, to the coming Messiah. And, and that, that, that choral um, Messiah by George Frederick Handel takes much of his material from, from Isaiah. And Isaiah uh, prophesied, he actually prophesied to both the northern and the southern kingdoms, during his, during his, his, his time, the, the northern tribes, the ten tribes, actually went, were captured. And so in the southern tribes, he, he prophesied before four different kings. Three of those kings were good. Um, Hezekiah was one of them. I think uh, Ahaz was one. He was a bad king. And then Azariah, Uzziah. He, so he, had, he prophesied actually between, before three good kings. And yet you look at, his, at, at what he says and, and the judgments of God that are coming, and 
So he says, behold your God, behold your shield. And I can imagine, if you look at, at much of, of, of the prophets and, and throughout, throughout the Bible, you look at in, in the New Testament, when, when the apostles are giving a, a sermon or they're, they're speaking to the people, they, they bring their past, right? They start right from the beginning. Remember Abraham. Remember Abraham's God who called them out of Ur. He called them and he set them and he placed them in Canaan. You remember that God. Remember, remember the God of, of Isaac and how he provided for Isaac. And, and the God of Israel. And my Sunday school class, we've been talking about Israel. And, and Israel, nearly half the book of Genesis is dedicated to Israel. Or a lot of that is Joseph. But, but the influence that Israel had. And, and what a man of God Israel was. <clears throat> and so oftentimes we focus on Israel and, and some of the things that, that he didn't do right. And yet Israel was... What a testimony. What a man of God. And the list goes on of, of Joseph. You remember the God of, of Joseph of Moses. You can't forget about Moses and, and all the things he did in Egypt and, and bringing them through and, and, and uh, of, of Joshua and Caleb, of Gideon, of Deborah, Elisha, Elijah. And the list goes on. David, remember your God. Remember your shield. Remember what he brought you through. The presence of God. So we see, we behold your shield. Secondly, this morning, be, beware of his strong hand. You look right there in verse number 10. It says, behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand. I like that. He's able to defend. He's ready to help. He's ready to comfort. But that strong hand. I can remember growing up uh, in, in Morris, Minnesota. My Sunday school teacher, uh, the, I almost think the entire time I was there, from, from third grade all the way till 10th grade, was uh, Mr. Gustus, Mr. Gustafson. He was a Norwegian guy and not very tall, well, about that tall, but he was a burly guy. If you think of like a Viking, he didn't have the beard, but you think of a Viking, that, he, that's, that was his shape and he was, uh, he was a fun guy. He had this burly laugh and, and he, was, he was a welder. He wasn't refined. He, uh, you know, he, he, he talked in double negatives and all these. His speech was not, well, you know, not a, not a high education. I was probably graduated high school. But, 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 but when he come and shake your hand, you better make sure that you, when you shook his hand that you got all the way into his hand. Because if he got the tips of it, you're going to have to go to the doctor. You're going to have to go get surgery in your hand because he was going to scrunch those things. And, and the next time you remembered, you did it once, and the next time you made sure that you gave him a firm handshake. A strong hand. A strong hand. That guy, who, it wasn't very big stature-wise, but man, he was strong. He was strong. He could lift those pieces of steel with, with no problem. And, and, and that strength is, is such an important thing. Strength is something we don't think about until we need more of it. There's many a time when I'm, I'm by myself and I'm on a job and I'm in a basement and I got to get this refrigerator out of this basement. Man, it sure would be nice if I had more strength. And usually, usually I can I figure a way to get it out, but, but it's not a very conventional way. But to, but to have that strength, and the, and the Bible says, you look at the next part of that verse, and his arm shall rule for him. Man, that, that, that fist... The extension of that is, is that arm. And, and to be able to have the strength. And to understand that when we, in God's presence, that his strength is there. It doesn't matter anything that I'm going through. God gives me the strength, or he provides the strength. He provides the ability to accomplish that what, what he wants me to do. And all oh, that we would that we would not... Def, uh, uh, de depend on my own strength, but that we depend on his strength. So we see, behold your shield, be beware of his strong hand. Thirdly, we see the blessed, the blessings of Shaddai. The blessings of Shaddai, the almighty God. And you look at, at uh, uh, verse number, verse number uh, at the, at the end of verse number 10. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work is before him. As we labor for the king, he rewards us for our, the efforts that we do. As we work for the king, he rewards us. The blessings. And, I, and this, this morning, if, well, I don't have time to tell you all the blessings that God has given for me. 
my wife and I, we, my, my boys have come home from college and, and there's this, this urgency that we have in our company to, to employ them, to keep them busy. And I, have, I have three boys and David's coming home and, and, and during Christmas and at summer, I have four guys that, that I need to keep busy. And, and, my, and th there's an urgency there and, and sometimes it's a little bit scared. How, I, I want to do this. I want to. I want to provide for them and, and have the work for them. And it's an amazing thing how God just keeps providing. He provides. You know, and and we're relying on His strength. And and it wasn't like this before when I was doing it by myself. God gave me just enough to keep me busy, but not to stress me out. And now, He's given me enough to keep them busy as well. The blessings of God. He's such a good God. The presence, to experience that presence. And third, or fourthly this morning we see the banquets of the shepherd. I like verse number 11. This is a, a great verse. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. We see that the bread is provided. The bread is provided. The, the Lord says, I'm going to take you right to the pasture. He says, I'm not going to feed you, but I'm going to bring you to the place where you can eat like that and just like like each one of us has most of us here have, have jobs and we go out and to provide for our family God says I'm not going to do the work for you but I'm going to provide you with the opportunity to, to take care of, of your family to to provide for to, to, excuse me to provide for that food the bread is provided and secondly there we see that the babes are protected the babes are protected he shall gather the lambs with his arm what a tender, compassionate picture that gives. He shall gather the lambs with his arm. The idea that he's taking these lambs and he's taking them in, and he's putting them in the hollow of his hand and he's, and he's protecting, he's protecting that, that lamb. And just like he does that for those lambs, how much more are we important to God? And you see where he puts them. Where does he put those lambs? The Bible says he puts them in the bosom of the physician. The bosom of the physician. And he carries them in his bosom. And he keeps them close. Aren't you glad that we can experience the presence of God and, and he keeps us close? He doesn't keep us, he doesn't keep us at arm's length. He doesn't keep us, okay, you stay in your corner and, and I'll be over here. But I don't want to be messed with until I want to be messed with. This last, this, about six months ago, we finished our, our master bedroom suite. And we never had one the entire time we've been married, my wife and I. And so we finished this suite and, and we took two rooms and, and made them into one room and a nice closet, nice bathroom, everything. And there's so many times when I, when I come home and I'm, I'm doing something. And, and those of you who have large families understand, sometimes you just want to get away. We have, we have, what, seven or eight? I forget. Nine sometimes with Dan when Daniel and, and Brittany are over. There's a lot. And then we have five dogs. And there's just all this activity. And I just want to be by myself. So I go to my room. And I sit in my bedroom. And I close the door. And I can't hear anything. And I'm like, ah, this is so nice. This is, this is great. This is great. I have the kids, if I need work to be done, I can just go out there and tell them what to do, but I don't have to hear them. And sometimes they'll come in and say, Dad, so what are you doing here? Oh, I need some tea. And so they'll go and get me some tea, and then, and I, okay, leave me alone. I just want to be quiet. But God doesn't act, he doesn't say that. He doesn't go into his room and, says, and sit there by himself. God says, I'm there all the time. I'm there, and my presence is with you. And finally, we see that I had to stretch to make this alliterated, but the balmy bulwark of the preserver. And I get that from, and, he care, and, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Again, what a tender, compassionate. But we got to look at, we got to look at God. Look at this God that's almighty. 
Sometimes, I, I mean, I think of, of when God comes, it, it, many occasions when he, when he came and defeated the enemies of Israel, and this God that, was, that just destroyed everything and the power that he has. And then in the same sentence, what's he do? He leads those, he gently leads those that are with Yahweh. That all-powerful God, and yet there's, there's a compassion. There's a gentleness. And so, you know, sometimes God, he, sometimes we need a knock across the head, don't we? Sometimes we need some senses knocked into us, and that two-by-four comes out, and whack! But sometimes we don't need that. And God comes to us and says, you know what, here. I'm going to put you in the hollow of my hand. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be compassionate. I'm going to be gentle because that's what I need at that particular time. The presence of God. I want you to picture, and aren't, aren't we glad, aren't you glad for the presence of God? I am so, so, so thankful for that. I want you to picture in your head Moses. Here's a, here's a, great, a great illustration of, of being in the hollow of his hand. Moses, you remember they were leaving, leaving Egypt. He had performed that last, that last, uh, the last plague had come, and, and Pharaoh said, get out of here. I want you to leave. I don't ever want to see you again, Moses. I'm going to, I'm, I will kill you if I ever see you again. And so Moses and the, and the children of Israel, they leave, and, they, and they're on their way, and they come to the Red Sea. And they have mountains on one side, and they have mountains on the other side, and they have this Red Sea in front of them. There is no way to escape. And then all of a sudden, they, Pharaoh has a change of heart. And he gets his, his horsemen together, he gets his chariots and, and his, his, all his army, and he's chasing after the children of Israel, and they box them in at this little corner. There's no way of escape. And you know what God does? God says, I'm going to put you in the hollow of my hand. Israel, they don't know what to do. What are we going to do? And they cry out to Moses, and Moses cries out to God, and God says, I'm going to take my hollow of my hand. I don't have my presence. I'm going to take that cloud. I'm going to place that on the back side so that, the, so that the Egyptians don't know which way to go. And I'm sure in the, in the middle of that, they, the, the, the Israelites towards the back, they could hear what was going on. And if they knew Egyptian, it would have been hilarious. To listen, these guys running into each other, the clanging and, and oh, get out of my way. Get, what are you doing? Get, I'm, get, and, and running into each other. And, and yet the, Israel was protected in the hollow of his hand. This last week on Thursday, my, we had to go to a, uh, a place where we sell equipment for, for my company. And they had a, like a, a dinner, a, a luncheon, and they brought in different uh, or salesmen and different equipment and stuff to, to look at and so forth. And so we went to this, this, uh, this luncheon, my, my three sons and I. We were, were there in Rochester, New York, and after we got done, it was like 3 o'clock, and I, I said to them, you know, Niagara Falls is like an hour, 15 minutes away. Because you guys want to go? It's like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, yeah, let's go. And Thursday was just this perfect, perfect weather. Perfect weather. And, and so they said, all right, let's go for it. So we went to Niagara Falls, and, and what, a beautiful, what a beautiful place. We spent three or four hours there. But it kind of has this, this idea. I could describe the Niagara Falls to you. I could, I, could, you know, I could paint the picture, and in my mind, I can see it all. I can see Gold Island. We came on, started on one side of, of the falls, and then we looked at it from this angle. Then we walked all the way around and looked at it from the other angle. And, and then we were able to go to where the Horseshoe Falls side was. And, and all the, what, a, what a beautiful, spectacular thing. We were actually present. We were, we were there. We got to experience it. I can tell you about it. I can describe all these things. I could even perhaps show you a picture, but it's totally different if you're not there. If you've never gone, it, I, there, there's no way to really to describe it. And you can describe in words what it looks like, but you can't really describe the mist falling on you. You can't describe the, the thunderous sound. You can't describe, uh, uh, you know, the river coming up to it as it coming over the falls. You, you, it's hard. To, you have to experience it. The same is true with the presence of God. 
We can know that his presence is there. I can describe his presence to you. I, I, you sometimes you can experience, but, but, but if you really have experienced it over and over and over, you know what I'm talking about. It's a whole different thing. The experience. The goodness of his presence. The second point this morning is the grandness of his provision. The grandness of his provision. Not only do we see the goodness of his presence, but the grandness of his, of his provision. In verses 13 through 19 of, of Isaiah chapter 40, the Bible says this. Who hath directed the spirit of, of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him. With whom, he took, with whom took he counsel, who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as a small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, they, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare unto him? The workman melteth the graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold and casteth silver chains. His provision. Many of these things that the Bible is talking about here is, is talking about the transcendence of God. It's talking about all the various attributes of God. It's asking questions where the only answer is, it's God. Who can do these things? Similar to what, what uh, in the book of Job, was a chapter in the book of Job is who, you know, it's talking about all the different things. Who, who was there when I formed the earth? Who was there when, when, when I made you? On all these different questions, and, and the answer is, is God. But in the grandness of, of, of his provision, uh, we see that, number one, that we speak the spirit of the Lord. Verse number 13, who hath directed the spirit of the Lord? That's spirit that speaks to us. I know in the Old Testament, the Lord, the, the, the God didn't do this. He spoke with the spirit to, to certain people at certain times. But as believers, we have the opportunity to listen and hear the spirit of God on a consistent basis. Number two, we see the speech of the lamb in verses 13 and 14. It's talking about with whom took he counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding, the speech. He gives us counsel. He gives us, he instructs us. He teaches us judgment and discernment. He tutors us in knowledge, and he describes it all in verse number 14. He shows us the way of understanding. I guess, I was thinking of an example how to explain this. And I thought, an example of baking a cake. I'm going to use Dawn, my, my youngest daughter, and I want you to picture you, with you this morning that, that when she's two or three years old, that I, I'm going to teach her how to bake a cake. Well, she's not, she doesn't have the abilities necessary to, to know how to bake a cake. And so she is there, and I'm baking the cake, and, and she thinks that she's helping. But I'm, I'm dipping the, the cup into the flour, and I'm you know, taking the knife and cutting it off there, and she's putting it into the bowl. Right? I'm teaching her how to, how to cook. And, and by the time the cake gets all done, um, there's a mess everywhere. There's a mess on her. Yeah, and, and, and the kitchen is a disaster. And she runs to mommy and says, Mommy, 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 I, 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 I baked a cake. Now, does she really know how to bake a cake? Not yet. But I've started the beginning process of teaching her how to, how to bake a cake. And so maybe a few months later, or a few years later, comes along, and, and, and I, I, I say, okay, we're going to bake a cake again, Don. And she says, okay, Daddy, let's, let's go bake, let's bake a cake. Bake a cake. I'm happy. I want to bake a cake. And so we get all the ingredients, and, and we start, and, I, and now I, I start to explain a little bit more. All right, we have ingredients in the cake. And I, say, and I, and I talk about the eggs and the milk and, and the butter and the flour and the, the oil and, and baking, so all these different things, all these different ingredients, and, and, I, and I say, okay, we got to get the, and, and I, again, I'm not, I'm just explaining some of these things. She doesn't have the comp, you know, you know, why do we stick it in the oven? She doesn't know all those things, but I, yeah, I'm taking the next step and counseling her and instructing her how to build a cake, make a cake. A few, a few years later, you go by, and I say, all right, Don, 
we're going to bake a cake. I said, okay, Daddy, what do you want me to do? And so this time, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna be, I'm not going to do everything. I'm going to teach her a little bit more. And, and so I give her all. I said, this is what I want you to go get. I want you to go get all the ingredients. Get them out of the fridge. Get them out of the pantry. And I want you to line them up right here on the counter. And, and so she does that. She gets, she gets most of those. She goes, Daddy, I can't find this. Okay, let's, uh, this is where we keep it. And so I help her, and, and, I'm, and I'm teaching her. Well, this time I can go in a little bit more, more detail. And I'll tell her, well, what? Well, Don, you know, we use this kind of flour because when cakes rise, it, this is the better flour. It tastes better. It, it, it rises better. And, and, and we use, you know, you know baking powder uh, or, and, and for, for this reason. And, and I'm explaining all the different reasons. And, and so she's learning how to, how to do these things. And, and God does the same thing with us. He doesn't give us. We have the manual. But if, if, if I were to tell you, uh, you know, there's my car, it's all in pieces, go fix it. You're not going to, I mean, th that's overwhelming. And so God teaches us slowly. And pretty soon, I'm, I'm to the next step. And I say, okay, Don, uh, this time you're going to go. And here's the recipe. You go make the cake. Well, she's made this cake maybe a, maybe a dozen times. So she kind of, she has experience. She's experienced it. She knows what to do. And so she bakes this cake, and, and, then, and then pretty soon she goes, Daddy, I want to learn how to make the frosting. And so we make the frosting, and, and, and wow, she's learning a lot. And then all of a sudden, I come up to her and say, you know what, Don? I want you to make lasagna. But Dad, I, I don't know how to make lasagna. I know, but I, I've taught you all the principles. I've taught you how to do all these various different things in the right steps. Now I want you to take a recipe. I want you to read the recipe, and I want you to get everything involved. And I'll help you, but I want you to figure it out. You see, that's what that verse is talking about. It's leading us in the counsel. It's leading us to the next thing. And over time, we're, we're understanding God, and he's teaching us. And all that we would, that we would take that and and give that to our young people, that we take that and, and to adults, to whoever we come in contact with, that the learning that God has given us, the teaching, the understanding of God's word, that we're sharing that with those around us. The speech of, of the lamb. And, and this next point here this morning is, is the smallness of the lands. The smallness of the lands. You look at verse number uh, 15. Behold the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are as counted as a small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the aisles as a very little things. I have a bucket. I had a five-gallon bucket up here. And I had a dropper. And see the gallon, the, the, the container was like half full. Half full of water, and I take a, a dropper, and I, I put one drop in that bucket. And I lift it up, and I, you know what? I can't tell there's a difference. There's no difference between one drop and and, and one less drop. And that's what God's talking about the nations. It's talking about the world. And sometimes as, as people, and, and it can be overwhelming, we look at what's going on around us and, and say, man, it's overwhelming. God, where are you? Are you bigger than this? And God says, I am. Look, that's, that's the nations right there, one drop. Why are you worried? I got everything under control. His provision. God, I don't know how I'm going to pay the next bill. It's a drop in a bucket. I'll take care of you. Are you depending on me? Are you waiting for me? One drop's not going to change the weight of that bucket. It's not going to affect the whole. He keeps us in the hollow of his hand. That next verse in Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. The idea here is that Lebanon, with all, with all the beasts, with all the animals, I guess this was a, a great hunting area, with all the animals that are in, the, in Lebanon, these animals would not even produce a small enough, a big enough sacrifice to how great a God we serve. If we cut all down the, the, the massive trees in Lebanon and we brought them together, it wouldn't even comprehend, it wouldn't even, it wouldn't be a drop in the bucket to what, we, what God is deserving. To offer, to make sacrifices and, and to burn uh, those offerings on, on that wood. Lebanon is not sufficient. 
The whole world is not sufficient. Nothing can compare to his greatness. And so on the last point here, we had, that was the smallness of the land. The last point under this, the grandness of his provision is the specialness of his lambs. The specialness of his lambs. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. To whom will you take liken God, and uh, what likeness will you compare with him? Essentially, Isaiah is coming to the people and saying, you know what, you, you guys are special. Why? Why in the world are you guys making things out of, out of wood? Why are you making idols out of wood? Why are you making, my, uh, making idols out of metal and, and bronze and gold and silver and forming these things and, and sacrificing it to them? Why are you doing this? He says, God's saying, you're, you're special to me. The whole discourse on, on, on these verses is, is maxi- maximizing the all power for God, the all presence uh, of God, the all knowing God, and it mi- minimizes the significance of man. It minimizes the nations are such a, a drop in the bucket, and yet, in the middle of all that, the Bible says we are important to Him. If a, fair does, a, a sparrow does not fall to the ground, does not God know about it? And aren't we even much more important than a, than a sparrow that's fallen to the ground? I want to picture in, in your mind that, that the God that we serve is this mighty warrior. This mighty warrior, and he's fighting the enemy with his right hand. He's fighting with that sword, and he's defeating the enemy. And in, in his other hand, he's holding us in the hollow of his hand. And he's protecting us because the enemy wants to destroy God, but he also wants to destroy you and I. And he's and he's holding us in the hollow of his hand, and he and and God is all within all of his power, all of his might, he's not gonna lose, and he's defending us. And we're safe as long as we stay within that hollow. Are we in the hollow of his hand? You see, I'm safe there, but what if I say, God? I want to get out of the hollow. I want to experience life on my own. And God says he'll still protect us, but it's kind of a a little bit different of a protection. I want to be in that protection all the time, knowing and understanding that that anything could happen, and and I'll, I'll be prepared. But if I get out of that hollow of his hand, I'm I'm exposed. The the enemy can, can, can come at me. So first we saw the goodness of his presence. Secondly, we saw the grandness of his protection. Thirdly, this morning, we see the greatness of his power. The greatness of his power. And this is chapter, uh, verses 20 through 31. He that is impoverished, that he hath no oblation, chooseth a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it, hath it been, not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in that bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. And he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take, away, shall, shall take them away as stubble. To whom, then, will you liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift, your, lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names of the greatness of his, of his might. For that he is strong in power, not not one faileth. What sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel? My way, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over my God. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that hath no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they 
that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Our first point this morning, we see a, fee, a feeble image. These, these children of Israel have, had gone after other gods. They had gone after other gods. They, they constructed uh, gods of, of, like I said earlier, of, of iron, of, of, of metal, of brass, of gold, of silver, of things that have been carved. A God that has no power. They put their trust in something else. Let me ask you this morning, why do we put our trust in, in Washington? Why do we put our trust in our education, in our finances, in our family? Why do we put our trust in our positions, in our careers, in our successes? Why do we put our trust in our abilities, in our appearances, in our situations? So often time we will take what, what God has given us, the abilities that he's given, and we place our trust in ourselves rather than the almighty God. His power. But we see that God's, God's not going to be mocked. He, we see a fierce I am. And you can look at 21 through 28. And I'm not, I'm not going to read all of it again, but, but and, uh, to whom shall you liken me, or, or, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? That bringeth out the host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might. My judgment is passed over from my God. This is the who, this is the I am. The I am. And no one is able to confront him. Oh, that we would understand that the power that he has protects me in the hollow of his hand. And finally, this morning, I under the greatness of his power, there's a faithful Ila, 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 or Emmanuel. This is God Almighty. This is actually that, that, that name of God. It comes from Daniel chapter 5, verse 18 through 21. 18 through 21. And this is as Daniel's talking to Belshazzar. And, and the, the picture here, or the story, is, is the, the handwriting on the wall. And Belshazzar doesn't know what to do. He's scared. And Daniel comes, and, and this is what he says, O thou king, the most high God, God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations and languages, trembled and feared before him, whom he, would, whom he, would, he slew, and whom he, would, he kept alive, and whom he, would, he set up, and whom he would put down. And when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne. And they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was, like, was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with dew of heaven. And this is where that word comes from. Till he knew that the most high God ruled in the kingdom of men. And that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. The same God that was then is the same God that we serve today. The same God that we serve. I want to go back to the, to the text verse this morning. Isaiah 40 verse number 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with a span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in, in a measure, and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance the hollow of his hand. Proverbs 30 verse 4 says something similar. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? That's another word for saying in the hollow of his hands. Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? As I go back to the description they gave of Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls comes from Lake Erie, and if you go back onto, onto Lake Erie and, and you were to look at the water around you, you would think, it's, what's the grandeur of this? I don't see the power. I don't see, see everything that's, that's happening right now because, because I, it, it's, I'm in the middle of a lake. I'm not experienced uh, Niagara Falls. But as the closer as I, as I, would, I would come to the falls, 
And, and where we were, were sitting next to the falls, you could look back and you could see the different elevations and, and how there's different levels of the rapids and the water's coming over and, and some of those waves, those backwards waves are four, five, six feet tall. And, and as you could, you could see the power that was coming in there. At one particular section, we, we were looking at, at, at the geese that were on different little islands there. And there was four different geese that were, that were swimming probably within 100 feet of the edge. And as I looked at these geese, I'm like, how, how are they able to, to withhold, to stay in, within those rapids? How are they able to, to keep swimming? And they weren't swimming with effort. They were just kind of sitting there. And the reason is because in front of them, probably six, eight feet wide, there was some boulders. I think there was a tree in the middle of them. But, but that, that water was protecting them, and the water was going all the way around them. Now, if you could consider yourself, if those, those geese had minds, if they could think, The falls are 100 feet away. The danger's there. And yet they're so safe because they're in the hollow of that rock. They're in the hollow. They're, they're being protected. They're being protected. Now, as I, would, as I would come closer to the falls, we went to the, to the goat island there, and you, you literally were right there. And that you could look over and you could see the water rushing over those falls and, and hitting the rocks below and, and the spray coming back and the wind, almost like a, just shooting the water and, and they're going way up into the sky, several hundred feet. And on one particular side, they had, I think it was the Bridal Falls, it's just a small falls, probably about this wide. And it was going over the edge and, and right at the edge you could really hear, it was loud, you could hardly talk to somebody next to you, it was, it was rumbling and loud. And, but if you took a couple steps back, and if I took a couple steps back and, and went back here, there's a little kind of a, a area almost like this of, of, of land. And, and I would come over here to the edge, and there was a little cove in, in the rock. And the water was rushing. The water was rushing on the side of it. But in that little cove, the water was, was barely, barely moving. There was, there, there was no rushing water. I'm sure the water was moving, but, but you could literally sit in there in an inner tube and you would be unaffected by, by the current that was going on. That's sitting in the hollow of his hand. I don't know where you're at this morning, but I want to be in the hollow of his hand. Sometimes we, all of us have gone through great struggles. Some of us have gone through some some tough times, a loss of a loved one, a loss of, of a job, a loss of a family situation that's going on. I, I don't know what situation we've all have gone through. Those. And I know personally I've gone through some of those things that I remember on several different occasions I'm going through these things and I'm not understanding why. And I'm struggling. Well, God, why, 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 why is this happening to me? I don't get it. I don't feel like I'm in the hollow of your hand. I don't feel like, like there's protection there. But you know, sometimes in the middle of those major things that are happening, when we don't see God, sometimes God takes his other hand and he, and he covers us up. And we're in the middle of that, that, that protection right there and we're saying, God, I can't see you. I got you covered. I'm protecting you. God, I, 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 what do I do? I, I can't see your hand. I don't know which way to go. And meanwhile, God is, is just bringing us along to where he wants us to go. And we're struggling. And God says, but you're in the hollow of my hand. You're right there. I'm protecting you. And sometimes when he lets us out and we get to see what's going on, Many times, we can look back and we can see, oh, you were there all along. I thought I was there by myself. No, you, you, you were there. And I can see all the different things that you, that, you, that you did for me. I can see the protections that were there. Oh. And we get to 
partake in what he knew was best for us all along. I want to close with this illustration, the greatness of his power. There was a hymn writer. Her name was Frances Havergale. She wrote a hymn called Like a River Glorious, and we sing that song often here. And This woman was, she lived in the 1830s, 1879, right during the Civil War. She lived in England, and a very scholastic lady. She, she, she knew several foreign languages. She knew Greek and Hebrew fluently, and she was a, a studier of, of the Word of God. She loved this book, and, and she did everything. She, she read it, and, and she wanted to spread it and, and share the gospel. And, and she became a, she wrote poems. And she didn't consider herself a prominent poet. And in fact, she didn't really think of herself as a, as a, as a great one. But, but she carved out a niche in, that only she alone could fill. She loved to sing, to sing and, and, and make simple and sweet songs or poems that talked about the love of God, that talked about his salvation. She wrote well over 50 of these different poems, and many of them were put to music, and most of them we don't know, or I'm, I was unfamiliar with. The other, another one that we know well is Take My Life and Let It Be. But as, as she came, and, and the history of, this, of the song, uh, Like a River Gloria, she, she became ill. The year was 1876, and she was vacationing in South Wales, and, and she caught a severe cold, and, and it, it, it got inflammation in her lungs, and I think it maybe was COVID-1 or pre-COVID, I don't know. But she was, she was sick, and, and the doctors came and said, you know what, there's, there's a good possibility that you're not going to make it. Obviously, the doctors back then, they, they didn't have the, the, the ability to diagnose and, and to give medicines like, like we have today. And, and learning of how, uh, how ill she was, she, this is what she replied, if I'm, if I'm going, if I'm really going, it's too good to be true. If I'm really going, that's where I want to go. And her friends and family were kind of taken aback and wondering why, why, why she would say these things. And then a few years later, she wrote those words, like a river glorious. And I'm just going to read them to you this morning. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace, overall victorious in its bright increase, perfect yet it floweth fuller every day, perfect yet it groweth deeper all the way. The chorus goes like this, stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, binding as, his, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. And here's the title of my message, Hidden in the Hollow, of his blessed hand, never foe can follow, never traitor stand. Not a surge of worry, not a shade of care, not a blast of hurry, touch the spirit there. The last verse goes like this, every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our dial by the son of love. We may trust him fully, all for us to do. They who trust him wholly, find him wholly true. We sing that song all the time. And I like that song, and, and it's a song of, of worship, and, and, and I can read you those words. But I want you to take Francis, the lady that experienced this. Can you imagine, as she's penning these words, hidden in the hollow of his blessed hand? I was there. And I, I can't imagine that she wouldn't, she wouldn't shed a tear. I can't imagine that there would be no emotion in her as she's writing this song. We all have similar experiences in life. We're hidden in the hollow of his hand. What a great God we have. He's, we see the grandness of his power, the greatness of his power, the grandness of his provision, and the goodness of his presence. All in the hollow of his hand, the protection. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the word of God. I thank you so much for the promises that you give us, for your provision, for your power, for your presence. 
that's always around us. But, oh, Father, I thank you for the experiences that you've sent my way. And, Lord, so many of them difficult. So many of them not understand completely why. But, God, because of those experiences, there's a deeper meaning. There's a deeper relationship. And as we meet here this morning, as we contemplate, as we meditate on, on being in the hollow of your hand, Lord, if there's someone here that's not saved, if there's someone here that, that needs to be in the hollow of your hand, if there's someone here that, that, that needs that, that encouragement and that protection and the, and the realization that, that you're still in control, Lord, we need that. With every head bowed, every eye closed. How about you? Oh, I want to be in the hollow of his hand. I want, I want that peace. And knowing that the world is raging around, I know that the, the power of God is, is an amazing thing. And that he protects me from the enemy. He protects me from sometimes myself. He helps me when I need it. He meets me where I'm at. This morning as we, as we pray to him, ask to be played, ask to be in the hollow of his hand. He wants to put you there. He, he wants to keep you there. He's promised that he'll do so. Right, if you finish praying, let's look this way and let's stand together. Thank you for that reminder of being hidden in God's hand, that we are always protected no matter what in our lives. God's in control. He's still on the throne. And like the Bible says, he will never leave us nor forsake us. So let's carry that with us as we go out today and this week and let it affect every aspect of our life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for that message. Thank you for giving us that from your word and be with us this week and today and help us to meditate on that to let it permeate our being that you are in control and you hold us. That you aren't going to leave us. You're never going to push us away. Give us safety as we leave today and bring us back safely tonight and Wednesday and next week and keep us safe in everything we do, Lord. In your sins, name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.